We've been, what book have we been studying lately? First Corinthians, right. Church of Corinth. Yeah, they were, they were pretty much a heathen people, and, uh, and Paul went there, preached there. He wrote two letters to them, and we're looking at first, the first letter he wrote. We're going to be in chapter 4. And uh, uh, Paul has talked about that we don't boast in anything but Jesus. He's talked about a holy way of living is actually worship and not just verbal empty words. He's talked about, uh, uh, you know, strife and bickering with each other and that he couldn't give them meat because when you act like that, you're just babies and all can give you some milk. He's talked about uh, people taking, uh, having favorites like some of y'all, like y'all, I know you like Jeff better than me. It just don't hurt my feelings. Not much. I just hope no bird flies by and, and drops something on my bottom lip. That's all I can say. But I pout when I pout, my lip comes out like that. How many of you ever seen it before? Well, that's not very nice to admit it. <laughs> so I, I, I follow Paul. I, I follow Cephas. I follow Apollos. I follow this one. I follow that one. Guess what? We all should follow Christ. That's the point, right? And today, all of you should be ministers of Christ as we talk about this topic. In a broad sense, everybody's a minister of Christ. And in their specific sense, here in chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, Paul addresses those who, who break down the Word, teach the Word, preach the Word, and he's not talking about the professionals. He's not talking about the pastors. However, just for a brief moment, just let me mention to you that we know we're all different, and we know that you enjoy one better than the other. That doesn't bother us. We love each other. We appreciate each other. We each can appreciate and receive from different ones. And we find it a strength because it's only been 250 years ago that we started making the one person the main teacher preacher. It's relatively new in Christianity. And that's why we got a lot of problems of people following TV evangelists and this preacher and that preacher, and that's the only one that can do it. And there's a lot of man following, and you set that person up to have a moral failure or a pride failure or a money greed failure because it's all about that person. How many of you know what I'm saying? Now, do you think I wear this right like this because I think I'm somebody, huh? No, it's because I grew up in the 50s. That's it. And in me, it just feels right. In fact, I don't even think I could use the, speak the word like this. But those goofy guys that were up here, I noticed they didn't look nice. <clears throat> they didn't have a shiny tie. They didn't have wrinkles. They did have hair. But they got good hearts. They loved the kids. And the Word of God is, is a part from, it has to do with the heart and how we receive it and how we deliver it. So just on a personal note, please don't do us injustice by doing the comparative game or all that kind of thing, right? So when you compliment me, quit saying you're better than all the other pastors. <laughs> no, no one does. That was a joke. <laughs> Nobody does that. Just say, Good word, Pastor. That's okay. Affirmation, building up, right? But be careful and listen to my message clear this morning. I hope it helps us all. And so we're, we're going to look at this, this uh, thought of everybody being a minister of Christ, and particularly some of you are sitting on your gift to teach or break down the word. You need to, you need to take initiative. You know, why, why is it that, that the paid people have to initiate absolutely all ministry? Now, I know it's not true. But you don't have to, you, you can come to us and say, hey, I feel led of the Holy Spirit. That is wonderful. It happens. So like if you, you want to have a small group, you want to be involved, you've got a topic on your heart, you want to teach, listen to me. Come to us. We want to empower you and engage you because the church is a, is a supernatural mechanism by which the Holy Spirit leads us and raises us up to do ministry among each other. It's, it's a unique thing. How I many you know what I'm talking about? So, so I'm, I'm talking to everybody here. 
I'm talking to the paid staff that preach and teach. I'm talking to those that are gifted, that are quote-unquote specific to this text, ministers of Christ that teach and dispense the word to be faithful to it. But I'm also talking in the broader sense that we're all servants of Christ. Okay, so I'll read verse 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version. This is how one should regard us, Paul says. And he's talking about us as ministers, okay? This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy or faithful. So the first thing I want you to see here is the responsibility of ministers of Christ, the responsibility. And, um, and, and so that word servant here, is the Greek word that means under rower. It's huperetus, okay? Huperetus. And that's the English pronouncing. And uh, an under rower, I'll show you a picture here, but back in the days, and when this is written, we had uh, two seas that were by each other, the Aegean Sea and the Ionian Sea. And uh, there was a, a, a bridge of land that kind of separated the two. And they would have war, and this is a Roman warship, and you can see how they would row it. And down underneath the bottom, there are men down there that they have a captain, and he says, when I say row, you row. And that's what they do. He'd give the command row. He'd give the command stop rowing. And they followed the captain's orders. And Paul uses this word that means under rower to mean servant. And everybody knew exactly what he was saying that they were servants like this where you got someone in charge and they're doing. Let me tell you something. I, the Spirit of God needs to be in charge of the church, not me. Right? I lead the church, but the Spirit of God needs to teach you, show you the Word, and give you what to say, and lead you in your giftings and servant. You know, like some of you, you may not be teachers. That's okay, but guess what? We need about eight people once a month to serve in the baby nursery. And I got a grandbaby in there. And, and you know, say, well, I, I'm not called to that. Well, you, listen, if you ever had a baby or got a grandbaby, you weren't called to change in their diaper either. Just get in there and help out. Okay, just sign up. So in, in a sense, the servants that help clean the church and pray while they clean some 50, 60 people that come in every week and they're cleaning different areas and pray. There's all kinds of ways to serve it. And, the, and, and, your, and your master or the one calling you out, I may help him, the Lord, a little bit, is Jesus. And here's a picture of those guys down in the under rower in the bottom, on the bottom deck of a warship. And, and how they would do war, and this is actually from around this time this was written, and that the front guy there is kind of how I look when I don't have my shirt on. Now go to the next slide. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Somebody say something funny? I didn't hear it. So Paul chooses this word, under rowers. He chooses this word to say servants of Christ, those that are handling the word of God. And uh, it's also used the same word several places in the New Testament. In, for instance, John 18, 36, when Jesus is before Pontius Pilate, and Pilate asks him, if, if Jesus, are you a king? And here's his answer. He says, my kingship is not of this world. You know, there's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world, right? He says, my kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants, there it is, Huperetus, would fight. My servants would fight. But the servants are following the voice of their master or of the captain of the warship as soldiers of the cross of Jesus Christ, and they understand that the one that is Lord, the one that is giving the orders, the one that has gifted them to do what they've been called to do in serving God is Jesus Christ. And he, they have their eyes on Jesus. Paul and Barnabas, on their first missionary trip, they took John Mark. And the Bible says, that, the Bible records it, that they took him to minister. There is that word again, to minister. Huperetus. There's that Greek word. And it wasn't that 
that he was, they were taking him to go minister to us, John Mark, do daily devotions to help us, John Mark. No, this was taking John Mark to line up the airline tickets, the hotel, the, the schedule, get the baggage carried, whatever else is going on, see? He is a servant. He's helping and coming alongside. And so there, there's what's going on because the, the serving, the, the heart of anyone that breaks out the word, and John Mark was a capable minister in that way, but the heart is to do anything to help that word be successful. I'm telling you. And it, it's really important. You know, you guys don't realize how important it is when people are trying to, especially when we don't have the grass, which is dry today, thank goodness, we can park, how important to people that are out in that parking lot. And by the way, the reason they don't let you pull up in that lot up there sometimes, some of you youngsters, is because we've got a lot of people difficult walking and we know they're coming. So when they tell you to do this, it's a compliment. When they don't let you pull up, you say, but there's a spot in there. They know, no, go by, go by. You know why? Because they know someone else that needs to park there needs to get in there, right? So you just move yourself along and go, hey, they're complimenting you. You look young and you can walk. So go get your exercise and quit paying the gym. Walk from over there. Hey, that was worth something like, other than a laugh, as like amen or preach it or something like that. <laughs> or oh me. But anyway, so he's there. He's their servant. He's their minister. And it's not about being a big shot, Paul is saying. We're all under rowers. We, our first responsibility, number one, the responsibility that we have as servants is, is, to, is to be a servant. The first responsibility of ministers of Christ is to understand that word minister is that we are servants of God together. And listen, it's not, there's something free about that when we understand that we're all having this coming from God. Because it's like, as a pastor, a lot of boards look like that they tell them what to do. They're over them, or the elders, or someone else in the church. And it's not that at all. It's not that the pastors are over the deacons or elders, or the elders and deacons are over the pastors. No, we're together ministering as servants. We're together with one purpose, cooperating in the Holy Spirit and in the Word of God to do the work of God. You understand? See that? Because you're all ministers of Christ, called by God in the Spirit. Amen? And then Paul says this, I love it. He says, uh, uh, and this goes along with that, Paul says in Galatians 1.10, if I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. In other words, you, 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 you don't, and I know I started the church, so it's like nobody hired me, because who would hire me anyway if they really knew, Right? I mean, the only way I could get a job is just to start a church, right? Because the boards weren't going to hire me. I tried to get hired a couple of places, and they didn't even interview me. I don't know if it's because of my picture or exactly what it was. Austin, you're going to have the same problem if you ever leave here. You're as ugly as I am, so don't, you know, <laughs> not, you know send, send Elizabeth in to do the interview, and you might get in, right? So, he's my son if you're visiting. Don't get mad at me, right? He can't help it. He looks like me. But we're servants, right? And we work together, joint ministers, servants of Christ, bringing this word to the world that is blind, that is life-giving and free, powerful word, resurrected living word, so that others can know Jesus. And the second thing, responsibility of the ministers, not only as an under rower or a servant, but stewards, it says. Our text says there were stewards of, and look what it says, the mysteries of God. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Well, what are those? What are those mysteries? Well, first off, uh, when it says steward, it's talking about like, uh, think, of a, think of an airplane, the old steward, stewardess, and they would dispense things, you know, and it used to be really something, but now it's like one pretzel and, and a peanut, not a package, it's like one, like one little, like 40 pieces of ice and one ounce of cola. Are you with me? Yes. And some airlines are so, so narrow, I mean, so cost conscious that you have to buy that ice in that one ounce. You have to actually pay extra to get it. So when you get that flight for $35, just know that it's going to cost you $400 more dollars by the time you check your luggage and get a, a Coca-Cola. So don't, don't be too rejoicing. But, but it's, like, it's like a steward or a stewardess, you know, it's like, it's like they dispense necessary or essential things. We just look at it that way. It's like, again, we back to the word serving, but we're stewards or we are accountable to, to, to serve, and we're going to be held accountable. Uh, we're, we're, we have something valuable that we are dispensing, 
right? And so their job on a plane is not valuable stuff, but our job uh, on a, on, in, with the Word of God is valuable. And so that's a very high calling to be responsible to serve something other than coffee and tea, but serve up the, the mysteries of God, amen? The mysteries of eternal life that have been trusted to us uh, by God. And so uh, the first mystery we see, and, I, and, I, and these aren't in your text, but the, I'm going to just give you a few of them. This is the mystery of the kingdom of God. You hear the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things be added. The kingdom of God principles are different than the kingdom of this earth. So just listen to me. What are some of those things, right? What are some of those things that we need to, to know and be able to teach? Because without the help of the Spirit anointed teaching and enlightenment of God's Spirit taking the anointed word and bringing it alive in people, we don't get creation. That's a mystery. God spoke, and there was light. So the human brain that's not enlightened, it's a mystery to them. They don't believe it. They won't know it unless we're servants breaking forth the bread of life. The virgin birth. Who, 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 who believes that? What about, what about the blood covenant that, that Jesus would die on a cross, shed his blood, and that would remove sin? What about the, the mystery of holy communion? that represents the covenant that Jesus made with us with his blood that, that his life would be in us. And what about our covenant with God as we are baptized in water and we say we're dying to ourselves and that we trust in you, Jesus, to make us alive, alive by the resurrected power, alive in God, alive in his truth. These are mysteries that, that don't make sense in the kingdom of this world. Without a spiritual aliveness, there's mysteries that we have to break forth out of the Word of God that in your intellect, you're never going to come to know that. The mystery of turning the other cheek. The mystery of loving your enemies and doing good to those who persecute you. The mystery that to receive is to give first. That giving or forgiving. Those are mysteries, folks. It's opposite of what our human nature and the world knows. These are spiritual biblical God kingdom mysteries and the earth kingdom has none of them it has be somebody get a lot of money and enjoy life because you only go around once right kingdom of this world versus the kingdom of God there's the mysteries of the kingdom of God to be to be opened up and then there's the mystery of iniquity that the dilemma that man keeps going back to their vomit they keep returning to the same old patterns. The societies never learn. I mean, you can study the fall of great empires, and every one of them is when government takes more and more from the people and dispenses it equally among everybody, where mankind does not have freedom. You can study it. You can study the history that when morality goes down the tubes, kingdoms fall you can every empire ever you will see that that even our founding father said that our form of government without the fear of god and the basic biblical christian principles to which we stand upon will crumble when the people quit living godly because it will cause a person to take all those freedoms and consume it upon themselves and then you get people that don't care for the needy don't care for the weak don't care for the handicapped they're rich and they're fat and they're selfish and they don't share because the god of of uh, of, of of our hearts don't dispense things the way god wants it to how many of you understand what i'm saying about and so our government our government can't re can't legislate the heart the government can't legislate your heart so it comes out wrong and there is this mystery of iniquity one one uh, philosopher Hegel, he said, history teaches us that history teaches us nothing. It's true. Can't believe how many people are saying, they're saying literally the Holocaust didn't happen. It's all a, it's all a joke. I've been there. I've seen where they burned gypsies and Jews and weaken people and old people by the millions. I've seen it. It happened. And it's an atrocity. And watch as the anti-spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist rises up. He wants to bring death and destruction against anybody that God loves. And who does God love? 
the people that follow him. Who does God love? The weak. Who does God love? The little children. He loves old people. Listen, there's a tragedy that happened back there in World War II where the weak and the old were put to death immediately when they came into those camps. They were sent off to get showers of gas and then stuck in incinerators and burned. And I've witnessed with my own eyes, young people, piles of hair and clothes, huge piles in great big rooms of where they shaved them and where they took their clothes and shoes of children and shoes and, and suitcases and pictures of the victims. And it's a horrific thing. And yet, humanity will do it again. And they've done it in the past. And over and over and over again, you'll see humanity fall into the trap because we don't learn. And here's why. The, 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 uh, the mystery of iniquity. Man is a sinful, selfish, greedy, lustful being, and only God can change the heart, which leads us to the mystery of godliness. Only God can make godliness. Only God's Spirit can change a heart. And we're going we're gonna to go, we're going to do things that are against God constantly until God puts His heart and His mind and changes and does something mysterious where we, our eyes are open to see the truth about how a man should live, the love that he should live, the truth that he should live out, and the, and, and the way his heart should be. You, are you with me? I mean, that's a mystery. People don't get it. Do you understand that? You see, they, they don't get it. And as a minister, I've been, I've been the victim of ridicule and cruel punishment because I stand up and they know what I represent, which is biblical godly values, right? And, and, and so I'm laughed at. Even in the church, I get laughed at. I do. And we have now in our culture going back to the hedonistic lifestyles of the past, of the Greeks, of Corinth, and of other biblical places where they would actually worship God with orgies. We have that going on again here in this world in different places. How many of you know what I'm saying? And we have people that will not speak up against sin and against that. And so you, to get aware of the mystery of iniquity and then the mystery of godliness where God renews and delivers, he transforms, and the power of the word to change a person's heart is a reality. Then we have to steward, steward all of these things. We steward the mystery of the church. We're servants, and we're servants that steward or are careful with the truth of God's word, and one is the mystery of the church. I mean, how many of you experience the fact there's a Holy Spirit connection because God is in a person? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're an eternal spiritual family. And sometimes your own blood brother is not as close as others. Or when you meet someone, immediately there's a witness of the Spirit, and you love that. You know, here's what I say it is. Look, look, look at me. I'm looking at you right there. I can't remember your first name. I know I know you. Raise your hand right here. Yep, 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 that family right there. When I first met you, I loved you. You know what I loved you? How did I base that? The mystery of the church. You're a member of the body of Christ, the church. And what did I say? I love Jesus in you because Jesus is big in you. I could see Jesus. And folks, I'm going to tell you the mystery of the church is when you look at people and you love them and it's a quick thing and there's a witness in you, what you're loving is God in their life. What you're loving is truth in their life. What you're loving is the love of their life, of God, and the way that person loves. That's what you love. And I'm telling you, it's, it's unexplainable in this world. It's a mystery of how the church happens. It's a mystery. And yet we try to run the church by the world systems. We try to, we organize what God has done in the church out of it. We organize the, the leading of the Spirit, the lifting up. It's like, oh, I will decide who will do this and do that. Let me tell you something. If you are gifted in teaching, you need to start studying the Word and be a teacher. Because if you can teach students, you can teach the Bible. And you need to start being a student and use your gift. And the Holy Spirit will raise that up. Because if we become an organization like the world, and it's uh, nothing wrong with organization. You got Kiwanis. You got all these great organizations that do good things, Right? But the church isn't that. It's a living me mechanism. It's the body of Christ. It's where Christ dwells in us. And there's a witness of the Spirit that we are children of God and brothers and sisters and forever family. Amen? Do you get that? I mean, the church is hard to explain. 
it's hard to explain and it's hard to understand why you love the church because God puts love in your heart for the church. I mean, the church is important, folks. Now, I know that going to church doesn't make you a Christian. In fact, I said it a couple weeks ago, I'm going to say it again. What we're doing right now today is the least important thing. It happens, but it's still important. So much that the Bible says don't forsake assembling together because we need each other to pray for one another and build each other up and teach each other and encourage each other and help each other with each other's children. Okay? We need each other. Are you with me? But what's more important is when you walk out of here that you're ministers and servants and stewards of what God has given you to do. Good stewards, responsible for that which is holy and important that God lays in your lap to do and let the Holy Spirit lead you and do it. And if you're sitting on the sideline because, you know, you suffered this or you suffered that or you were hurt or you don't feel adequate or because of some sin of the past, get up off your seat because God forgives and he reuses. We just learned about King David who, who in effect, committed murder to the husband of Bathsheba and then slept with her, right? And then God still used him, right? So I don't care what your background is, God wants to use you, hear the Spirit, and be used of God mightily because the church is important and it's a mystery and you are a part of it, so let's rise up. And then the last thing it says, the responsibility of a minister is to be faithful, found faithful. It actually is translated in this version, trustworthy. But I think the word doesn't mean faithful or trustworthy, it means both. Now, I will to be faithful to the word but as I do and I live my life, I want you to be able to trust me. How many of you trust Pastor Jeff? Some of you don't know him. Pastor, Pastor Brian? Pastor Brett? Me? <laughs> the other ones I know you don't trust. It's okay. But uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Let me tell you something. Our job is to be faithful with what God gives us to do and dispensing the word and to be trustworthy with it. And I'll, sometimes I will say I've, I've, I've failed. And I know you probably have. But let's pick it up and let's be faithful and listen to me. When you're, when you're, if you hear something about someone that doesn't seem right, I had this experience, a friend of mine named Tom, and I heard something and I said, I don't believe that's true. And I went to search out the facts. I found out what I heard wasn't true. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a defender. And what was true that I heard, my friend admitted every drop of it with humility and took responsibility. But the dispensers of what I heard would not admit their responsibility. And I'm going to tell you something. If you hear something and it doesn't fit the character or what you know about the person, you hear something about Pastor Jeff and it doesn't fit like what you know him to be, you might want to go and get the facts. Because there's always people wanting to say things that aren't true. Always people not wanting to take responsibility for what really went down. And there's always people wanting to point the finger at somebody else. Are you with me? So let's be faithful. And which leads me to the next point about evaluating, evaluating the minister. Responsibility of the minister evaluating is a common problem of how people evaluate us. Look at this, what Paul says with me in verse 3. But with me, it's a very small thing, 1 Corinthians 4, 3, that I should be judged by you or by any human court, by you, the church, meaning the congregation, or by any human court, that's public opinion, I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. I'm not like not guilty. I mean, it, it's the Lord who judges me, he says. Therefore, don't pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. He's saying don't judge the motives of man. That's what he's saying, the purposes of the heart. Then every man will receive his commendation from God when Christ comes again at that time, right? And he's not talking about judgment that casts people out of heaven. He's talking about judgment of motive. So the first thing he mentions is the congregational evaluation, point A. The first thing is he says, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. And 
there's a pressure with the congregation that judges Sunday school teachers, other people that break the word, leaders of ministries, or anyone that does anything for God. There's a pressure in that that a person can praise you and lift you up and you get the big head and get, many a people have been messed up by thinking they're the best. That's one. Adulation. Second is there's the manipulation. The evaluation and then come and manipulate them and you manipulate someone by not wanting them to say, talk about certain things. Let me, can I just politely tell you something? Hear my heart. I will always speak what the book says and what God gives me to say. I had ministers, I, I, how many of you believe in the gifts of the Spirit in the last days, Acts chapter 2? How many of you believe the Bible says young men shall see visions, old men will dream dreams? I had a dream and I knew I was supposed to share it and I was scared to death. And I knew I'd be ridiculed for it. And how many of you know that probably the dream was to me because I'm old, right? That's the proof that I had a dream. No, I've had only a few dreams and I'm positive as I sit here, I know for sure I had the dream and I was supposed to share it and what that dream was about and who that dream was to. And yet even other ministers ridiculed me for sharing a dream. Nobody here, nobody here. So, I mean, Austin might have wanted to ridicule me for something else, but not that, so. <laughs> but the thing of it is, is, is there is this manipulation that people will want to do. Sometimes commending you for saying this and this so they want you to say more of it. And commending you for not saying this and this because they don't ever want you to bring that up. And they manipulate you to not bring up certain sins or not speak on certain topics because they don't think that you ought to. Well, guess what? Who's the master of the warship? I'm an under rower, Jesus. And when Jesus says to me, talk about something, I will. And he says, don't talk about it, I won't. So we don't want to allow ourselves to be manipulated not to speak the word that God gives us or teach how God would give it to us. And then also in evaluating the minister, not only is it wrong to compare and to praise and bring adulation or to manipulate, but it's also a problem uh, of antagonism, like just being against them, opposing you, you know. Like honestly, can I just say something? I know that for some of you, I'm your least favorite preacher and others, I'm your favorite. There's one person that thinks Pastor Hawkins is better than me. <laughs> and that's me. <laughs> but if you're going to encourage Pastor Hawkins, don't say, boy, I really like coming to church, Pastor Hawkins, when you preach. Right? Because what are you saying? You're saying today, May, whatever, you really wish I wasn't preaching. And I'm saying... I really wish I wasn't preaching too. <laughs> it's not my favorite thing to do. I wouldn't do it if I didn't feel called from God, but I'm called more of my gifting of pastoring. So, and then, you know, you might evaluate and say, these young pastors need to grow up. Duh, they're young and stupid. Of course they need to grow up. <laughs> How are they going to do it? People say to you, man, you're really good at hiring good young pastor man you really hire I say yeah and you know how many times I've had to say you forgot this you didn't do that you should never do that you better go apologize for that that was stupid that wasn't the best thing how many of you know what I'm saying but you know how many ten times more of that when I was their age that they had to do that to me and I remember our illustrious former superintendent correcting me more than once delightfully some of you that's just the way it is isn't it right Let's just be honest with each other and let's encourage and, and build up without comparative, but also let's just not rip a person down and be antagonistic and just put them down or talk behind their back, right? That's a, that's a good word. Then there's the, he says, the, uh, the uh, uh, society evaluation. There's not only the congregation, but society. And he says, uh, or by any human court, he says in, the, in, in this passage, verse 6 or 7, I'm not going to be judged by any human court. In other words, 
the, the mindset of what a minister is is a hot, hot, full of hot air, a windbag. And I will tell you, like I said before, I've been treated really, really like ignored and treated poorly by people who just didn't like what I believed. You know, they don't want you to judge them for what they believe. So they believe this is okay and that's okay and you really, they believe all of this and I'm always kind and loving and I treat everybody the same, but if you're going to talk to me and you want to know what I think, the conversation, I'm not going to lie, I got, I got to be true to myself. And so whether it's conversation or teaching from this pulpit or in a class, I'm going to say it and guess what? They don't like it. And so there's this society evaluation and pressure that comes, it's why we have churches that now ordain people that live a homosexual lifestyle they put them as ministers i love everybody i don't believe in that and i'm going to answer to god i'm a steward of the word because the book says it moses talks about it jesus talks about it paul talks about it and they all have the agreed statement they all talk about it okay so i i i i just i just can't go with that i can go with god loves them and god cares about them and god will help them but I can't go with that. And it's across the board in multiple church denominations that, that are Christian, and yet it's not in agreement with the authority of the book of the Bible. And so I'm not going to give in to society pressure to not speak against sin. That's, that's all. Then the next one is society evaluation. There's the evaluation of the congregation and of society. And third is self-evaluation. He, Paul says, I don't even judge myself. He knows that his judgment isn't right anyway. When God comes back, he'll know the motives of the heart. Let him judge. Right now, he says, I can't think of anything that I've done, but I know that, you know, I'm not perfect. And I, I know that God's the one that's going to do that. So I'm just going to, like, try not to go there, Right? And there is an examining of yourself. Examine yourself, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says, examine yourselves whether you be of faith or not. So, but there is a blindness of our own faults. There is things that we need people to help us and call us out and confront and love, iron sharpening and iron. But, but Paul is going, you know, it's, it can be very unhealthy in, if, if the wrong kind of self-evaluation. Like in the early service, I got, I got like an E. I mean, you know, I didn't get an A, B, C, or D. I wasn't that good. I didn't get an F. Oh, some of them may have thought I did. But I think I got an E. I don't even know what it stands for, but it wasn't very good. But, you see, when you, when you go through a book of the Bible, there's things that need to be taught in that book. And here's the value of this lesson today and this teaching is that for us to understand, and this is it, the final point, because self-evaluation can be bad too. The final point is that the freedom that comes, the freedom of the minister. You have the responsibilities, an under rower, a servant, stewarding the mysteries of God. You have the evaluation that can come at you, controlling you or causing problems by the congregation, by society pressure, or by yourself. And it will mess you up where you don't want to do it. Because trust me, I've evaluated myself and said, I can't preach my way out of a wet paper bag. I ain't never going to do it. I said to my wife, I'm done. I can't do it. My son has said to me, that was terrible, Dad. You should quit. <laughs> You're getting old, boy. I said, I know. He didn't really say that to me. He's honest to me and loving and gracious, but he does push me. That boy can preach, can't he? did do pretty good last week, didn't he? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty proud of him, to a, not to a point of sin, I hope. But there's a freedom, guys, and it's verse 6 and 7 that, that, that bring, it says it, it, where the apostles set forth the freedom that's enjoyed by ministers. Here's what it says, I've applied all this to myself, Apollos, for your benefit, brethren, that you may learn by us to live according to Scripture, that none of you may be puffed up, comparatively up in favor of one against another, for who sees anything different in you? I mean, what have you that you didn't receive? If you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? Listen, if I can do good teaching or preaching, I didn't get, God gave me that. He could have given it to somebody. He can take it away from me. I, I'm nothing. It's God. 
So I asked this closing question, is it make a difference what the congregation thinks, what society thinks, or what, uh, what the public court, court of law, or, or, or what I think when it comes to, to the Word of God? No, we, we need to just be faithful stewards of God, and we need to be free so that we encourage each other to be used in the gifts. So let's watch what I say. Here's the, here's the, here's the takeaway. Watch what we say. Compliment, but don't compare. Don't puff up because the pride comes before the fall. And so avoid rivalry uh, from the ministry and watch out for conceit and pride because that's, that's the thing that will get us. And then, uh, you know, I think of my wife one time. After I, I preached, I was pretty young. I preached a great sermon. We were in the car going home. And man, I'd hit a home run and man, people were telling me how great it was. And I said to her, you know, honey, I wonder how many great preachers there are. She said, one less than you think, brother. I said, <laughs> you're talking about keeping you humble, boy, that right there. I mean, that just tells you right. Now, y'all know that I'm just telling the story there that I've kind of personalized. I'm sure my wife probably told me that, but only in different words. But anyway, that's pretty funny, isn't it, huh? You know, the point's not to make you laugh, but to make you think. So as the musicians come, let me ask you a question. Who's the Lord of this church? Jesus. Who's in control of this church? Who's your Lord? Who's in control of you? Who gives you rest and who gives you peace? When you go to God, the Lord is running to you. He's speaking to you. And I'm asking you today, and I'm going to invite anyone that would like to be prayed for or for sickness. I know Rusty Miller's home and sick and He's been doing this chemo treatments for cancer, and, and uh, Rebecca Bruce and, and others are, are fighting um, cancer and getting treatments. And let's see, um, um, Cheryl Dexheimer and um, uh, yeah, Helen Rule and, 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 and then um, uh, Kristen Harris has is, is been in the hospital really sick. So there's a lot of people that need prayer. But you may be here and you may need physical prayer or some other prayer, and this has nothing to do with the message, but we are a body, that's the mystery of the church, we can pray for one another. So I invite you to come, but I also invite you to just lift your hands and surrender your heart. If you don't like lifting your hands, it's okay. It's just an outward symbol. It's no different than going, we're number one, right? You know, like people are, what's this mean? Susan, what does this mean? Sick'em bears, yeah. Symbol, right? Let's see, what does this mean? Is that, is that the Cleveland Indians? What is that? Huh? Kansas City? Royals? Chiefs? Oh, football. You know, surrender and honor. That's all it is. Surrender and honor. And there's something that the hands are the expression of the inner man. So when I first learned this, it was so uncomfortable to lift my hand. But when I got that freedom, I just, I said there was just something that happened in my heart that happened in my hands. I don't understand it. Surrender and freedom, it just is powerful. But would you stand and if you feel so compelled, maybe you start off like this. Push them on up. <laughs> and let's sing this song. It says, who are we going to trust in? Jesus. I'll trust only in you. God's perfect. Amen. Let me ask you a question. And I say this led by the Spirit. So you're going to go, why? This is weird you're saying this now. I'll ask you a question. If I lived out of wedlock, or if I'm living with my wife and she wasn't enough woman and I was just also embodied with another woman, would I be okay to be your pastor? Anybody want me as your pastor? Raise your hand. I, don't, I just thought I'd ask the question. I'm making a point. There is a standard. And while man is imperfect and God's quick to forgive, there's still a standard. The holy word. Truth. And you may be here and you think, you know what, I, I've sinned. I need God to forgive me. I'm telling you, he runs so fast. You talking about Austin running? The Lord runs at you so fast to forgive you. 
as a prodigal son, if you know that story, he runs to restore you and make you part of his family. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, I just need forgiveness. I need God to forgive me. Would you lift your hand? Yes, 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 Jesus, you see the hands forgive, Lord. Free from strongholds. Free from strongholds. Keep your hand up there in Jesus' name. Free from strongholds. Free from lies of the enemy. Free. Help us, God. Forgive and let there be no condemnation or guilt because your grace sets us free from all of that. There's no reason we should live in shame. Jesus, forgive and witness in their spirit the supernatural thing that happens inside a, a member of the body of Christ. Let them know, I love you. The spirit, you're my child. I forgive you. I'm not holding against you. I will help you and I go with you in the name of Jesus. Receive it with, with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Amen.